Hey, what's up, Seekers? Welcome back. I hope you all can hear me. I hope you're all cozy wherever you're dialing in from. I I think I'm live. It's telling me I'm live. Um, so I hope you're here with us. If I am live, someone tell me down in the chat and I'll know and that will be super. It is really great to be here to celebrate reaching 25,000 subscribers, which is a crazy number. It's hard to wrap my head around what 25,000 seekers together might look like and what they may be able to achieve. Um, it's a really wild thought, and, and I didn't think that it would ever get to this um, streaming from my bedroom. But but here we are, and uh, it's worth celebrating. And what we are celebrating essentially is you. We're we're, we're celebrating twenty five thousand of you joining us here to learn, to grow, to explore, to connect, to unite, uh, to get closer to ourselves, to one another, to each other, to nature, to to God, whatever that big ominous word means for us, and. Um, Certainly, it's 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 weird to call this a Q and A because I don't think I have the the answers to to anyone or anything. But uh, questions are good. Questions are are some of the things which I love most in the world. And uh, I hope I hope to be able to spend some time with in question and with questions and with you, wonderful, beautiful people here. Um, I I didn't share in the Discord that we're going to be going live, but I'm sure uh, someone there can share. <clears throat> And um, I see there are a couple of people with us already. So thank you for joining us. And some people have very kindly sent in some donations, some super thanks to the channel, which really does help the work go on. So cheers to you who have sent in um, BC Clarity and David Brackman. Thank you very much. That's very sweet and very kind. And I guess what we'll do is we're going to start trying to answer is a weird word, but discussing some of the questions um and we will see where it goes from there and hopefully questions will lead to more questions um we are just coming off some of you may have been hanging out with us we were previously uh on dr angela puka's hangout she just reached fifty thousand subscribers uh we we're hanging out there with our good friends justin and philip together with angela uh and i'd like to say that it's such a we, we, we shared this there but it's such an honor and privilege and pleasure to be sharing alongside such beautiful wonderful creative kind and, hum and humble humans. Um, so if anyone doesn't yet know the work of Dr. Angela Puka and isn't yet subscribed to her and to Justin and Philip over at Esoterica and Let's Talk Religion and Angela's channel is Angela's Symposium, please do. Um, and with all that out of the way, let us crack on and answer some questions. I'm going to begin with some questions that um, we got sent in in advance, and then we'll move to new questions here. And, uh, and feel free to come. Questions uh, can be, they can be serious, they can be silly, they can be, they can be, there's no, there's no Adam Fast rules. Okay, so we got a question from Walmart. And Walmart asked, uh, or wrote, I uh, discovered your channel from Sam Arano about a year ago. Shout out to our good friend Sam Arano, who has a fantastic channel on Jewish history. Uh, under his name, and we may be doing something together coming up soon, so please do go check out Sam's work. Uh, and the question from Walmart is, what got me interested in mysticism, and also, am I Chabad? Thanks. So, what got me interested in mysticism? Thank you, Mediocrities, for the super chat. Cheers. Last time when we've done uh, live streams together, I was um, drinking some alcoholic beverages, and, uh, and I don't know if this is a sign of my age now, but here I have some sage tea instead, some sage that I picked at the local uh, community garden. So maybe I will, I'll have some sage tea for every new uh, new super chat. Every So cheers to mediocrities. What got me interested in mysticism? We actually were just chatting about this over at Angela's stream. Um, what got those fine scholars interested in their fields in esotericism? Um, and I shared... Uh, and I'll share again here for those that weren't there, that I grew up, uh, and I, I'll answer both questions uh, with both questions with one answer, two birds with one stone. 
I got interested in mysticism because I did grow up in the Chabad community and I still do identify as a as a Chabad chassid. Um, and Chabad, for those that aren't aware, is one lineage, one tradition within the broad spectrum of Hasidic movements that began in the 1800s in Eastern Europe by uh, under the guidance of a beautiful, radical human being by the name of the Baal Shem Tov. And, um, and that mystical tradition was one which I grew up in and was exposed to, and I didn't know that it was a mystical tradition because we weren't taught about it in those categories. Uh, it was simply Hasidus, it was simply uh, the truth as we were told it, taught it. And at about the age 16 or 17, I discovered that mysticism was a universal category that existed across traditions. And that was uh, quite a mind-blowing exploration, uh, uh, discovery, and I've been exploring that discovery ever since. Um, and I do think that mysticism has some really vital uh, messages and practices and ways of living that might be very, very instrumental uh, in our thrival and maybe even survival uh, in the present moment. And that's kind of the work we do here behind the scenes is try and explore the convergence of mystical traditions from mystical traditions from around the world and where they meet with the philosophy. I see here we have in the chat, uh, let's talk religion. We have we have Philip. Uh, Philip is a very kind, uh, long-standing friend of the channel and who we just hung out with. If I knew a way that I could loop uh, Philip here into the chat, uh, into the sorry, into the live stream, I would. But I don't know how to. <laughs> we'll have to figure that out together. Um, but we just uh, we just streamed together for. Uh, about an hour and a half and it's always a pleasure and uh, I really do look forward to working together for many good and healthy years together with such beautiful people. Thank you, Philip. Okay, I'm going to try and answer the question somewhat somewhat briefly and uh, so that we can, so people can get a chance to have their questions addressed um, and we will, hopefully it won't be too brief. I hope no one feels like they're not getting an adequate answer. Uh, you can always message me later and we can we can talk more. So, um, we have a question of what I think of Rudolf Otto's work. Rudolf Otto's work, I've enjoyed um, a lot of Otto's work, uh, Mysticism East and West, uh, a, which is a wonderful comparison of uh, Adi Shankara, a, a Hindu mystic from the Advaita Vedanta tradition, the founder of that tradition in many ways, together with Meister Eckhart, uh, perhaps the most um, influential, significant Christian mystic uh, in some senses, at least in contemporary academia during the Middle Ages, uh, someone who's been studied very thoroughly and heavily um, in the in the contemporary setting by Bernard McGinn. Uh, and that the work that uh, that um, Otto was doing was before sort of the new wave of scholarship of mysticism, which has become much more critical and piecemeal and skeptical, and, and it was much more broad and sort of open to making grand claims similarly, uh, so on similar lines to people like uh, Corbin and Charlemagne. While their scholarship is, is sometimes not the most accurate and later generations come and do a lot of nuancing and cleaning up and, and making the picture more accurate, there's a certain, there's a certain, um, well, bombastic would be a, would have negative connotations, but there's a certain grandiosity and a certain creativeness and inventiveness that they're going to these quite unexplored fields and really trying to make sense of them. And there's something very uh, fresh and ambitious about those about those authors. Um, and I'm lumping them together; they're not the same thing. But someone like Evelyn Underhill as well, where they're really trendsetters in the field, uh, where there isn't really much work done before them um, in in a or, or work that was that was <laughs> work that comes before them is is pretty is pretty paltry um someone like evelyn underhill and i i have a particular soft spot for those early scholars and and i think that they're they they have become an object of study for themselves and for good reason um and maybe we'll do a video on it these days on some of those early scholars i really would like to do a series on on, on early scholars of mysticism and, and rudolf Otto definitely belongs in that of course we didn't mention the the book the work which he's most famous for which is uh in german das heilige translated into english as the idea of the holy, which began to explore mysticism in a phenomenological way and asking some important questions, and I think still an important work um, and one definitely worth reading. Okay, um, we had some more questions here. Let's see what's happening in the live chat so people that are here live don't feel neglected. <laughs> um, BC Clarity said that they found deep ecumenicism here. 
and um i shouldn't maybe i'm not gonna read these compliments it's too much <laughs> not not a uh, true lover of mysticism thank you that's very kind of you um when is okay <laughs> and losing grace media ask uh, hey, when is the big philosophy video coming out? We haven't even spoken about it yet, but Andalusian Grace, who's here with us, um, is one of the collaborators. We do have a big philosophy collaboration coming out. It may be the biggest uh, philosophy collaboration uh, on YouTube of all time, which would just make it of all time, I think, in that, if that's the case. Um, we are still waiting for some final collaborators to get on board, uh, and we'll slowly start to tease what that video is about, but we have... Uh, we, we have a very, very big philosophy club, which includes many, many philosophy creators. Uh, and that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, it's probably going to, I'd say, in about a month or two. We have some other collabs as well coming out. Lots of fun stuff happening here. Um, we're working on three three large collabs, one with, with philosophy creators, one with religious studies creators, and one with a local uh, educational institution. And that will all hit the airways of the channel in not too long. Um, Sam asks, I'm, I'm reading these questions in real time, so excuse me if I if I need to take a moment to digest them. Um, how do you make sense of people who have had mystical experiences despite being non-religious? To what extent can mysticism be separated from theology? That's a really great question. It's a really great question. Let's try to answer that carefully. So mysticism historically has almost always been a property of religion belonged within a religious context there are some historians that will say always something that happens or that happened historically within religion um, and that only in the modern period does mysticism break out and do we have the possibility of something like a secular or or irreligious um, or non-religious mysticism that definition uh which gershon shalom is famous for for voicing amongst others relies upon a specific uh, definition of mysticism, which is mysticism as a reaction to theology already. So Shalom wouldn't see mysticism that's pre-religious historically uh, as mysticism. He may call it something else, um, but he wouldn't call it mysticism. So so for Shalom, uh, and Shalom is really writing as um, sort of the modern new age interest with mysticism that begins in the 60s onwards really becomes a huge cultural phenomenon. Shalom's writing <coughs> primarily <clears throat> before that really becomes a substantial thing and, and he's writing sort of on the cusp of that. So for Shalom and for other scholars of mysticism, some who we mentioned earlier, mysticism is something that's happening strictly within religion and therefore gets examined and studied as a theological or, or a reaction, a theological category as a reaction to theology. My thinking on that is different, and, and it's a thinking which as well is prevalent in, in many contemporary scholars of mysticism uh, who have witnessed a proliferation of mysticism outside of the context of religion. And the thinking just is, is that mysticism, uh, or what we call mysticism, is just a, a function of the human organ, of the human organ, <laughs> the human orgasm. What am I saying? I'm tired. The human organism um, that, that, the human has experiences, um, we have all kinds of experiences, <clears throat> and there is a category or a slice of that experience, which seems to be quite an extraordinary one and one worth studying and one with which may have some, some hold some promise for us that, um, that we call mystical. And that has nothing to do with theology inherently. That becomes theologized because of the nature of it, because in that experience, one believes that they're encountering the real the numinous um, God sometimes. So therefore, automatically, they, it gets picked up in theological terms and language and structures, but that humans simply have this experience that, that the ordinary experience, um, which we will call non-mystical, of a, a, a sense of separation, alienation, isolation, a separate subject and object, where that somehow dissolves and falls away, that is what we would call something of a mystical experience and it takes many forms and i want to reduce it just to one type but just to for sake of simplicity to answer the question so so i don't think it's i don't think it has to be particularly religious at all i think this is a, a human experience and i think that um how would we make sense of people having mystical experiences despite not being religious is because they're humans 
uh, there's there's some scholars that that wanted to coin the human the homo mysticus the, the human that has the capacity for for the mystical for the transcendent for the numinous to encounter the real um and i think mysticism can be discussed outside of the context of theology and i think we can talk about mysticism in the context of 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 therapy and psychology and neuroscience and all categories that aren't strictly theological um, and then of course part of that discourse becomes theological um the general and this will be the last point then we'll move on to the next question the general framework through which we've been analyzing mysticism here at the channel um, is is through the framework of a very helpful definition of mysticism given by Peter McGinn, by sorry by Peter Moore, um, M double M double O R E, <clears throat> who divides mysticism into three categories of experience, theory, and practice. So if we can assume that humans are having what we call mystical experiences, um, through the help of practices that are leading them there and then practices which they emulate going forward humans also want to be theorizing to make sense of those experiences because they're particularly meaningful and 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 they call for some sort of interpretation and one of the ways in which humans theorize about mysticism is in theological categories it's not the only way we theorize about mysticism in the categories of mythology and philosophy and metaphysics and science um, but when we're theorizing about mysticism in a theological setting or con context or construct, then it becomes theological. I don't think it's inherently theological. But that was a, that was a very fun question. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from um, from Philip. Let's talk religion. He says, "Who has the best beard on YouTube?" Well, I can't judge by all of YouTube. That's a lot of beards to take into account. We'd have to do a real wide beard survey. But I think um, I think if it's amongst the the beard tubers here over on the religious studies content creators, uh, the beardos, <sighs> I think I think Philip. Oh, actually, I, I'm not going to say this is going to this is going to lead to a lot of broken friendships. I'm I'm just going to leave that un unsaid. <laughs> um, okay, Robin Baroda asks um by the way thank you everyone for, that's here i see there's a bunch of people that are here with us uh and that have liked the live stream i'm glad you're liking it uh what images come to you if any when you daven which is the hebrew word for pray uh or is it yiddish um especially amida which is the standing silent prayer that practicing jews do three times a day um, what can you remember as a very young child is your first thought about Hashem, uh, literally the name in Hebrew, uh, the colloquial term for God um, in in modern Judaism. Ooh, wow. <laughs> I, what I, what I love about this question is that um, where sometimes we like to show up in sort of one-dimensional representations of ourselves, and and uh, and the previous question put me in a scholarly. The previous questions put me in the, in a scholarly mindset, trying to talk about different conceptions and frameworks and models um, that have been employed and and, and their usefulness. Uh, and now we have a question about about prayer, uh, about davening, um, about images, about what what uh, what God was for me like as a child and. It's demanding me to um to show up with a different side, and I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate being more than just a, a, a scholar, um, which I which I aspire to as well. But also, I aspire to be a prayer, someone who prays. Um, you know, there's a there's a line in, in the Book of Psalms where the attributed to King David, which says, "Vanit filasi lecha," that that I. If you, it's if it's read as it is read out of fit out of its grammatical context that uh, that I am a prayer and then we aspire to become a prayer. Ashir la Hashem says the same book as well that that our very lives can become a song to God. Um, so what images come to me when I daven when I pray? Um, it's also very it's it's interesting. I, I appreciate that the question was phrased in my own sort of native language. Um, because for me, davening means something very different than praying does, and because words obviously carry connotations. I think that um, I think that for me, praying, davening, um, as for many, 
um, is not a simple activity. Um, it's an activity which is filled with a lot of um, struggle and doubt and moments of, of, of serenity and surrender and moments of question and, and absurdity. Um, it's not for naught that uh, in the topography of prayer and study, which are often contrasted in Jewish mystical literature, study is considered um, a peaceful activity, uh, whereas prayer is considered a activity of war and strife. It's, uh, it's referred to as shast slay, so it's a, it's a battle that one engages with, a battle with the self, uh, of course. And, um, and I, definitely, I definitely feel that. I feel, I feel, I feel the, the battle in it. Um, I, and, I, and, I, and I also, I, I don't want to give in to the assumption that, uh, that a simple or easy or smooth prayer is a successful prayer, and one which was filled with strife or, or doubt was an unsuccessful prayer. I think that the, the struggle itself is, is worth showing up for. Um, what images? I think, I think that a lot of the image of the imagery of prayer um, in, a, in a Jewish context, in a Jewish mystical context, um, is very much connected to the letters of prayer themselves, the Hebrew letters, uh, and the letters of God that are evoked and and spoken in prayer. Um, and there's a, there's a strong relationship between the vocalization and the visualization um, of letters, Hebrew letters, and particularly the Hebrew letters with the name of God in prayer. And that's um, something which which comes up, and that's a natural association, of course, because we begin praying with a prayer book, and then uh, and once we be doing that for a few years, we can graduate onto praying you know, with our eyes closed if we choose to, but those letters stay with us. So I think that um, sort of those those dancing letters and those letters are very animated in the Jewish mystical context. They're discussed, they're, they're presented very poetically as black fire and white fire uh, sort of dancing on each other. Um, so, I, so I think the first image which is coming to mind in response to this question um, is, is the letters themselves. Um, we hope to, I, I do plan actually to be doing some upcoming work on the channel on the Hebrew alphabet, and we're going to speak about the the morphology of the letters and what those letters means and what the different shapes connotate and, and what they and what they evoke um, in the practicing mystic. Um, and the second part of the question from Robin was, "What can I remember as a very young child is my first thought about Hashem?" Oof, I I don't I don't know what my very first thought about Hashem about God was. Um, I. It's it's interesting because um, in the Jewish tradition, a, in a tradition going all the way back to the Talmud, the first thought that the child has about God is or about Hashem is a thought which they cannot even remember. It's it's the it's the sense it's the it's the knowledge of God that the child has in the womb of the mother, um, which is a very fascinating idea, very fascinating and beautiful. Uh, Madrash, which says that when the child is born out of the womb, an angel comes and flicks them upon the upon their upper lip, um, which uh, in in in, a, in an academic context we would call this an etiological myth, a myth which explains the origin of something. And in this case, it's little indentation um, in the lip that's explained by this by this myth. Um, you can't see mine because I have this beautiful mustache, but just underneath it, it's still there. Um, and I think besides, if we if we were to examine this simply as some sort of scientific um, anatomical explanation, it, it would fall short. But but psychologically, what's going on here is very deep. Uh, the sense that that the child in the womb of the mother experiences a certain oneness of being, a, a union with the maternal that that is you know the mother of all life. Uh, and in that experience, it knows all of Torah, it knows all of wisdom, knows all that is true and good. Uh, and it is to that womb that we strive. You know, it's interesting that we did some recent work on Jung here, uh, sorry, uh, Freud here on the channel, and Freud criticizes mysticism particularly because he sees it as a recession to infantile narcissism, to the union with the mother. Whereas the Jewish mystics see, um, Buber makes this case very beautifully, a modern Jewish mystic, that the child's experience in the womb of the mother is really the pinnacle of human experience. Everything from there is downhill in some sense, and, and leaving the womb is very traumatic. And all of our lives, we strive to come back to that unity, to that warmth, to that protection, to that safety that we felt uh, in the embrace of the mother. Uh, and we and we can feel that with the Divine Mother, with the Shekhinah, we can feel that with nature, we can feel that in relation to our own mother. Um, and Buber himself felt that in relation to his, to his lover, who he felt as a replacement uh, for his mother who had abandoned him as a small child, very sadly. 
So maybe the first image, the, the first thoughts I had about Hashem were ones that I cannot remember because I was flicked, but were uh, thoughts connected with with the the sense of kindness, um, the 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 womb in Hebrew um, is called the Rechem, which sa- which shares the same etymology as Rachamim, mercy. Uh, one of the most beautiful names of God is is the All Merciful, one which is shared by Muslims and Jews, the Arachmin, the the the, the All Merciful one. So maybe that's the first thought that I had of God that I cannot remember. Okay. I said I would give short answers, but these are beautiful questions and they need more than just short answers. L- uh, Shel Solomon said, Mazel Tov, uh, Letitia. Thank you, Shel, for being here. Shel is a good friend who's featured on the channel a bunch. Shel most recently appeared in the interview that we did together with Professor Rabbi Arthur Green. Uh, Shel, cheers to you, my friend. And uh, may we be able to follow these, these paths of, of unity uh, to to ourselves, to each other for for years to come. L'chaim shal. Leo says, I would like your opinion on this. Um, similar to how we perceive things, our notion of what is is filtered through our being. How do you think, um, do you think that's how the anthropomorphic God came about? So there's, a, there's an old line that goes back to the ancient Greeks that if, um, that if the that if the triangles had a god, he would have three sides, and uh, <laughs> and tri- it would be triangular in nature. Uh, a line that's repeated again later by Spinoza and many others. That that when when the horses imagine a god, they imagine uh, a god that has <laughs> horse features, um, and that certainly we do filter things through our own being. Um, and is that how the anthropomorphic god came about? It seems it seems it seems pretty clear that that we must reason from ourselves that we don't really have anywhere else to reason or speculate from. Um, there's there's an interesting. I want to take this question in a slightly different direction. There's an interesting question of um, there's 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 an assumption that's made. Let's say that a God who is impersonal and that is non anthropomorphic, that is beyond uh, any human structure, be that physical or psychological, is somehow the the more pure the truer god and we see this battle playing out in in many theologies in judaism we see this battle playing out between the early sages of the talmudic period who were giving all sorts of dimensions of god and speaking about god in a very personal sense and that's from the bible straight through the talmud up until someone like maimonides who launches a radical project to de-anthropomorphize god both psychologically physically and philosophically and we did a whole series covering that maimonides very thorough negative theology um with with the assumption here that if if you're if you believe that god is anthropomorphic is human like in some sense then you're not you're not really believing in the real true god what's interesting is to see to see the inversion of that where mystics who themselves also have a very reified a very pure very abstracted non-human impersonal version of god the Kabbalists, for example in their ain't stuff um, Hindu mystics in their conception of Brahman and, and elsewhere. Um, Meister Eckhart, who we mentioned before, in his conception of the God as the ground of being the Ungrund. But the same mystics will sometimes very tantalizingly tease the possibility that God as pers- persona, as personality, as anthropomorphic, is somehow still more true and more deep than simply the unspecified the, the the god the empty god of, of of nothingness and that's a very interesting direction and I think that there's a sense where philosophically you want to reject that we want we want the pure version but as humans we perhaps know that some there's something really true um in the human experience to connect to a human deity uh, and and I think I think that maybe in life we can have the maturity to know that it's not a question of one or the other, which is better, which is worse, but rather which moments in life require us to tap into those images, which moments in life require a personal, a, a persona, a God that has pathos, that has feelings in the way that humans have, and which moments in life require us to connect to something beyond that, to get beyond our own humanity. Um, and sometimes that's because we need to expand our own conception beyond an anthropocentric notion of ourselves. And if sometimes 
the ultimate being God is itself human, then that may limit our capacity for uh, compassion and care for things that are not human. So I think it's not a question of which is better or worse or which is higher or which or where it comes from, but but rather more like um, when when do we need those? And that's that's a question of wisdom, not of knowledge necessarily. Okay. Uh, Angela is here. Angela Symposium. Angela says, congratulations. Thank you, Angela. Congratulations for Angela, who just reached Dr. Puka, who just reached 50,000 subscribers. Um, as you mentioned earlier, please do head over and um, subscribe and say hi and say Mazel Tov, say congratulations from us here at Seekers of Unity. It's a pleasure and an honor to be creating together with you, Angela. Next question is from Iran Gabe. Congratulations. Where do you live? Do you like your neighborhood? <laughs> I live currently in Jerusalem. Um, do I like my neighborhood? Um, it's a beautiful neighborhood with lots of beautiful things. There's a lot of beautiful uh, community gardens here. Um, there is a beautiful synagogue, a beautiful shul, shul nimri where I can pray. Um, and I have a lot of great friends around. Um, so yes, I, I do. <coughs> Karen Simon says, thank you for your content. Zavi. We need more. Of it. Thank you. I hope to be able to create more of it together with all of you wonderful people. Um, okay, let us continue scrolling and answer some wonderful questions. Um, Kai Raikos Ronis, I hope I pronounced that somewhat right, asks, for those of us that prefer reading the material, have you considered making a public database of the best, most relevant and important according to your books slash papers? Goodreads comes to mind. I, yes, there's been a few requests um, over the over the past few months to put together some sort of um, unofficial curriculum um, or framework of study of mysticism. It is on my to-do list um, and it will happen, God willing. I do want to do it. Um, I can't claim to have read everything on mysticism, but I've read a fair bit. And, uh, and I would like to put those thoughts together. And I've already began to collect um, a document with some of those with some of those works and with a short to be like to make it an annotated bibliography to tell the reader what they can expect to find in the book um and yes it's on my i have a long list of projects that i want to get done um and may god give us the strength and courage to get through that list um thank you for the question um life itself next comments life itself and all within it is um, life itself and all within it is religion. However, not as humans can understand it. The higher mind of omnipotent slash omnipresence is where the understanding and higher view is in my brain. Nice. Um, Nathan Fisher asks, which of Verveke's ideas are most exciting to you? And now after your dialogues with him, are there any that you disagree with him or find problematic? Uh, wow, interesting question. Um, John Verveke, um, who Nathan is asking about, is a, um, a brilliant public intellectual uh, professor of um, cognitive science and psychology who's doing some incredible work, bringing a lot of meaningful philosophy to the public. And John is a, a close friend and interlocutor with whom we've worked in the past, and we, we're actually right now working on something together again. Um, what ideas are most exciting to you in his thought. I think I think John's has an incredible way to synthesize a tremendous amount of information that often isn't put together. Um, for those that don't know, John put together an incredible 50 part series on his channel called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, where he, where he demonstrates the way that many, many schools of thought from the ancients till the modern um, can converge and to, to bring meaning in the modern human life. Something like a project of Pierre Hadot, of whom he is very fond, uh, I, I see John as, as, as doing that project um, over in a much more thorough modern sense what Pierre sort of hinted to, um, I see John doing. And um, I think I think John's general concept of relevance, realization that the human is constantly taking in the, 
the, the data that is coming to them and trying to find ways to artfully uh, dance through all of the decisions we need to be making every moment. And when we can do that just right, we come to some sort of um, flow in that experience. And that is partially how we understand uh, the mystical experience along those lines. Um, check out the, the episode we did, uh, or the episodes rather, discussing the connection between his work and mysticism. Um, and I think that's that's some very interesting research. And, and I want to see more bridges between um, mysticism and cognitive science. And, and we're working on something along those lines um, as we speak. Is there anything um, that I disagree with or find problematic? I was thinking about this recently, um, and, and I'll share this because I think it's important to share. I think that the most um, persuasive thing in John's philosophy um, is John himself. And I don't mean that as a criticism of his philosophy. I think his philosophy is, is really beautiful, uh, rigorous, well-informed, um, and mind-boggling sometimes. But I think that beyond all of that, um, it's him as a person. It's him, the way that he lives, the way that he interacts. Um, and I've gotten to know that personally um, with tremendous kindness and presence and, and wisdom, I think, um, is, is the most compelling aspect of his philosophy. I think what troubles me most, and this is a criticism which I've shared with John, and something which I hope to discuss with him, um, perhaps publicly, is, is that um, sometimes when we want to look at a philosophy, we have to look at the producers. Um, and William James makes this case very brilliantly for mysticism as a whole in his phenomenal book, the varieties of religious experience. And James argues that while we cannot know the first time experience of the mystic and it holds no persuasive philosophical content for someone who cannot access it, um, we can look at their fruits. And James finds their fruits in the realms of, of ethics and behavior and pushing society forward in kindness and 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 to, to be the most effective um, aspect of of the of of the mystic. Um, my my question is i'm curious to know the i see a lot of the community overlap between myself and john a lot of the questions that i get from people that i see belong to that community seem to sometimes be lost in the deep end of 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 lots of books and lots of words um and finding ways to channel that into practice and i know john works on this in his ecology of practices into the um the practice of of connecting with other humans in meaningful ways. Um, I get a lot of I get a lot of questions um, as as do content creators and and sometimes I try and respond to those questions and tell people give people sources and where they may we be, be reading. Very often in a response which which I'll give to people and people here may have received it. Um, and and particularly I think people coming from um, John's community and overlapping communities. Uh, my response is is not any answers, not any book suggestions, but simply uh, like a suggestion of of how about like you take up volunteering as a practice, um, go and visit your local old age home, or go and help a food drive or a community kitchen, um, and I think that maybe that would be my uh, one of my criticisms, and I'm I'm trying to tread lightly here because I really really respect um, John, and I don't I don't use that word lightly I, I don't respect that many people uh in my life so um so that's that's perhaps uh, I, I hope that's clear enough um what are my thoughts okay let's try and move a little quick we have lots of questions here <laughs> and we're like 40 minutes in what are my thoughts on Gurdjieff um <clears throat> I think Gurdjieff uh is a really fascinating modern mystic and um, and I, I do hope to get the chance to to make some content uh, about Gurdjieff on the channel. Um, I think Gurdjieff has a lot of kind of mysteriousness, an aura of mystery around him, um, which makes it hard to to access and and to get even an account of his of what his what his beliefs is. But beliefs are are, are difficult, and and most people are going to get them through Ospensky, through his student, and even then they're they're. They're not quite simple. And I think that's intentional. Gurdjieff doesn't want his disciples to be able to have concrete, simple answers, which they can then, you know, take for granted because his entire project, and he would hate anyone saying what his entire project is, but his entire project in some sense is the, the breaking down of the autom 
automatization of the human. And I think in that he's quite similar to a lot of uh, modern mystics, although he may want to see himself as as sui generis, as sharing no similarities. But I think about someone like Arthur Dankman, who did a lot of, a Harvard researcher who did a lot of work on mysticism and psychology and, and talked about mysticism as the capacity to break down the uh, the automatic habits that we uh, evolved to 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 do in in our everyday life and, and and mysticism or the mystical experience rather is when we stop that process stops and we can just see the world fresh without all of our layers our the, the doors of perception that, that block us from seeing reality uh, i think another mystic uh, who falls into a similar category um is something like colin wilson the english or the only english existentialist um whose love his work was about uh, catching catching ourselves before we jump into making our automatic judgments um, and, and being able to sort of process uh, the world as it is uh, raw. Um, and he has his own phenomenology of that, which is very interesting, in which he begins to develop um, towards the end of his life. Um, although he started working in it far earlier, someone like Aldous Huxley also makes a similar case. So I think I think there's a trend of, of modern mystics. And, and Gurdjieff tries in some quite... Um, bombastic ways to break humans out of their automatize, automatizing, to turn them from machines really into being humans. And he doesn't think that most of us are humans, we're awake. Um, and I think it's interesting. There's a lot of this quite similarity there to to the, you know, the Zen Buddhist who will slap the disciple to kind of wake them out of their, their illusion. Um, and so we have a lot of those antics He's an interesting character, and, and I hope to come back to him. I hope to, to share some, some of my own thoughts um, in, a, in a video on him. Um, a question from Robin Baroda, mysticism related to direct experience, question mark. Um, I think that may be different to what we're speaking about now with Gurdjieff. Um, protagonist Poimander says, congrats on the subs, brother. Thank you very much. Um, thinking aloud with Mendel, um, a podcast uh whom with we just recorded an episode that's going to be dropping very soon i recommend everyone checking it out i guess the question is can a philosophy of psychology be divorced from the theology um yeah i think they can i don't think there's any reason necessarily why they must be done theologically i think that theology is one certain uh, prism or angle or window or lens on examining um Mysticism, uh, a human experience, and I don't think it has to, I think it can be. Um, <coughs> Edeline Diaz says, I came to this channel for the bid and continued for the content. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad the bid did its job. Um, Follow the white butterfly said, hello and congratulations. Thank you. Love seeing you here as well. Um, Questions. Let's let's see where's the next question. Um, love to learn more about the Hebrew alphabet. We're going to have some very fun content coming on that. Working on something very exciting for you guys. Um, Astosh confirmed. Um, Kabbalah community says, "Hey Zevi, can't stay for long. Want to say hi. Love your work. Thank you very much. Glad to have you here." Um, question, can you please do a video on the Messiah? Is it a singular person or is it a collective people? Yes, um, I would like to do a video on messianism, the history of messi messianism, particularly uh, in Judaism. Um, I just finished making my way through. Um, I'll, let me grab it for you. Um, make my way through this, which is uh, essential papers on messianic movements and personalities in Jewish history. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's a nice thick book. Uh, this is some some 550 pages um, covered now with my notes. This will be converted into a video, uh, but um, yeah, we'll get to it. <laughs> what is Hi, Zevi. Do you have any thoughts on how folks like Eric Frum um, have discussed the Messianic Age? Yes. Um, so, from 
from is interesting from i i would put uh in a broader context um of modern humanistic psychology um maslow uh another name that belongs to that field um but but many others as well um <coughs> it's it's quite interesting i think that um I'm going to give a similar answer to what we did with Gurdjieff of sort of put him in, in relation to some other thinkers. I think that um, what's happening, if, if we can sort of boil down one idea that's coming out of from um, out, of, out of the other humanistic psychologists and then out of, out of, out of other authors of the same period, um, I think that Buber, Buber and Heschel um, fit into the same category. A big concern for them, um, and this is part of the Messianic project, is the way that we treat um other people in our lives and, and other things in our lives um that we treat them not as people or or as but we treat them as things we treat them not as uh ends in themselves but as a means to an end um buber famously coins the terms the it or the thou do we treat something as a you um a you which represents the divine you the infinity that we encounter in the other uh, as levinas would put it or do we treat them simply as an it as something that we can get pleasure from or we can advance our own career from um, and from uh, in in many of these works has a, a similar drive in him and i think it's a beautiful framework and i think it's one worth reflecting on and i think that um there are questions which which have to be done authentically and questions which um are troubling questions to ask in a contemporary society where we so often instrumentalize and we make things an end Sorry, we make things a means towards an end and not an end in itself. Um, and we feel almost forced to, to do that sometimes. And it, it would seem like an absurd activity to, to, to make everything that we encounter a, a you um, and give it give that the, the, the depth of dignity and grandeur that it deserves. Um, but I think it's one, I think it's a challenge worth taking seriously and holding on to. And, and I think it's an interesting challenge for me to, to talk personally, I mean, we're sitting here with some twenty-five thousand subscribers, and and uh, and how do, how 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 do we come to each other as full persons, as a full you, and not instrumentalize the person? How do we not see them, the person, as simply a number uh, towards some greater goal, which would be a horrendous way to see a human, which would be the the full dehumanization of the human, which from Buber Heschel. Um, uh, to cries and and that's a challenge and it's a challenge because um because the answer isn't an obvious one because if it meant getting into a deep intimate personal relationship with twenty five thousand people then then that may become a bit of a nightmare and impossibility um and these are these are real questions and i think maybe it comes down to how do we how do we work within a system that that places us as objects in relation to one another and and be conscientious objectors towards such a system and say, no, I'm not going to treat you as simply reduce you to one thing like a subscriber, or you're not going to reduce me to, to one thing like a content creator. But I'm going to see you as a human, and you're going to see me as a human. And, and in that, there'll be kindness, and there'll be forgiveness, and there'll be understanding, and there'll be, there'll be connection and unity. Um, that's maybe a word on Fromm's messianism. Thank you for the question. Thank you, James. Um, do Kenobi asks, do I have a book which I remember fondly? Um, oh, I, I remember a lot of books fondly. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Well, in this context, I do have some fond memories from uh, from previous live streams that we did together here <laughs> with, with a different beverage in hand. And uh, we did two books together. One of them was Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, and one of them was The Little Prince. Uh, and those were wonderful books to read. Uh, I think during Siddhartha, um, we definitely laughed a lot, and I cried at one point. Um, so that was a fun, a fun book to read together. Um, yeah, many, many fun books. Those are just two of the many uh, that, that are pertinent to this context. Thanks for the question. Um, first name, surname says, to not accept the human form a deity um, is an envy sign why an actor why a uh, omnipotent being cannot be 
it's opposite and go beyond its own omnipotence without making of it a okay good point there i'm also i'm sorry i'm a bit dyslexic if i, I don't read well you'll have to forgive me uh justin dr dr justin sledge from esoterica uh thank you for being here with us um he says congratulations z and his question is what mystic slash mystical texts have you always wanted to get around to studying but haven't yet i <laughs> lots lots I'm, I'm terrible i i have so much i want to get around to studying and uh, i need to be more disciplined and make time to to study and not only study uh for content <laughs> Um, but I really would like to, and this is something that we've been discussing recently, um, I'd really like to properly go through the Enneads of Plotinus um, and Proclus's Elements of Theology, and our recent discussion and work together has has put that higher up on my reading list. I have something like a, a nine-page long document. There's just one line for every book that's on my reading list, and that page only keeps expanding. But I think um, I think um, I want to read Plotinus. Um, it's the book that I would take with me. I think now to a deserted island. I've had sort of fantasy of doing it together um, in some sort of live week, like biweekly hangout or something, um, maybe. So thank you for the question, Justin. And I put the question back to you. What is the the mystic or mystical text you've wanted to read but haven't gotten around to? Which is going to be a hard question for Justin because Justin's read like everything. Justin is. Is, is insanely well read and it's very intimidating to to, to be creating content with justin thank you man um love you sam says are there mystical critical traditions in judaism maybe other faith as well if you know about them Myst uh, oh other mysticism critical tradition other, other traditions which are critical of mysticism in judaism of course yeah of course um so just just two um for example um in the in contempt in sort of modern judaism um the hasidic movement to which i belong um was met with a fierce opposition um by a group um spearheaded ironically by a mystic himself but disagreed with the way that the mysticism was being spread um too broadly by the hasidic movement um by the vilna Gon. And the movement became known as the Mitznagdim, literally the opponents, the opposition. Um, and that's that's one example. Um, so they weren't critical of mysticism per se, but critical of the way that mysticism was being peddled so freely. Um, a valid criticism, no doubt. Um, and then there's also another mysticism critical tradition, which comes out of the what's called the rationalist school. In Judaism following people like Maimonides, which is again a great irony because as the people that follow the chapel know, uh, we believe that Maimonides himself was a mystic and it's a position which is becoming more and more um, accepted um, in, in academia, um, th that Maimonides' rationalism and mysticism are not uh, at odds with each other, but are actually very, very similar and, and, and exist only with one another and uh, for both historical and conceptual reasons you can check out the eight hour long series we did on that to, to know what we're talking about um but there is uh an anti-mystical and an anti-capitalistic more specifically movement that comes out of Maimonides and his followers and that continues till today uh so that certainly does exist yes um and and in other traditions as well of course there's a tremendous amount of opposition um that is that is raged uh, against christian mystics and sufi mystics and and Eastern mystics to a slightly less degree, but um, of course, if I understood the question correctly. Um, Global Toffees says, congratulations, uh, had a triple bypass operation on the 26th of October, listening to three specific podcasts and yours mentally for the journey through that operation helped me get through. Wow. Firstly, I'm so glad that, that I was able to help you prepare for that. Uh, how are you feeling? How how did the operation go? How is the healing being? Uh, and I'd like to wish you a lot of healing. And um, I'm 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 touched beyond words that I was able to to be there with you and for you uh, in that moment. Wow. I I I wish you a a, a complete and speedy recovery.
Um, Global Toffee says that his name is Joseph. Thank you, Joseph, for sharing your name. Um, what an incredible thing to share. I feel very humbled. Robin Broda, who asked a great question for, comes back with another great question. When we say before Friday night Kiddush, um, we quote that God created the world in six days, very anthropomorphic, yet we know at the same time that the world <clears throat> is billions of years old. How to square? <laughs> so there's been a lot of work done trying to square up the scientific age of the universe with the biblical and religious uh, ages that are given. Um, I I don't engage so much in religious apologetics here at the channel. It's not what I do. Um, it's not what I find interesting or or particularly um, particularly pertinent, at least for myself in the moment, in this in this present moment. Um, <clears throat> so firstly, I would if someone is struggling with religious questions, I would recommend from whatever tradition they belong. I'd rec I recommend checking out um, some if good and and try to stick to the honest um, apologists out there. <clears throat> and there is some good work being done. <clears throat> um, I think I think the way that that I'm answering the question for myself these days, um, and and you're going to see some of that on the channel soon, in, in something that I'm working on, is to distinguish between what's a what is a historical question and what's a religious question, um, and I think that these are two different questions, and and historical truths and religious truths are two different truths, and historical and the questions we ask of them are not the same questions. And I think sometimes we can make a category mistake by thinking them. And I think that um, God creating the world in six days can and does have a tremendous amount of meaning um, in our lives, can have, <clears throat> um, if, if it's something that we connect to. Um, for the mystic in Judaism, that's a tremendously significant number and statement, and the mystics read that as uh, God engaging with the final six sefirot, uh, with which God creates the world in the seventh Malchut reflects the Shabbat. So these are these are questions which are, I think if we reduce them to chronology uh, and history, we're actually missing the point and we're, we're missing the meaningfulness of them. And and we should let historians and scientists answer historical and scientific questions, and we should um, answer questions of meaning. And I think I think that's an important distinction to make, and that uh, would approach given subjects and, and each one we can discuss for example what is the um what is the religious psychological truth uh, in such a statement and that's a truth which, which is changing all the time as it must uh, and then what is the scientific truth um and that's a question of, of what whatever the scientific consensus is um zen boy thank you for the question robin zen boy says as an ex-christian i'm grateful to many Chabad rabbis for teaching a deeper understanding of judaism good good work to my colleagues out there um, Sandeep says, love your message and work. Can't wait to see what you do in the future, especially in regards to interfaith ideas. Any interfaith videos coming soon. We've done a lot of fun interfaith stuff in the past. Um, we do have we do have something else planned on those lines, uh, some interfaith work um, in relation to some interfaith Muslim and Jewish schools here in Jerusalem. Um, and that is something which is just in the planning stages uh there's a lot of planning and <laughs> and bureaucracy and emailing that needs to that needs to happen before we can pop out at the end of days and weeks of work at a 20 minute video so um yes we will continue to do that work because we believe in it and we believe that it is what uh these ideas demand of us okay We have some book recommendations here. Um, Fritz Peters. Okay, I will I will take note and uh, we will check those out. Thank you for the book recs. Um, thank you, Gaz Thompson. Uh, question: What role, if any, do you see psychedelics playing in a mystical path? Um, Yes, I think um, um, we're also 
I think psychedelics um, have played important roles in in mystical paths for a long time, and and uh, and I'd like to do some work on the history uh, of psychedelics and psychedelics and entheogenics in religious and mystical traditions. <clears throat> I think I think um, one thing which I particularly relish in is is the historical component um, to understand how we got to where we are today. I feel that missing in the contemporary discussion to some extent. Um, Walter Hagengraf and some others have done some good work on that, and I'd like to bring that work to the public. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, psychedelics certainly play a very important role in contemporary mysticism, uh, in the revival of mysticism um, in, in the beat generation and people like Huxley who wrote about his experience with mescaline and that continues only to, to flourish and grow and is now, of course, being um, <clears throat> studied scientifically rigorously um, in places like John Hopkins. <clears throat> and, uh, sorry, one second. Sorry, I've just been uh, ill with a bit of a cold, um, so I apologize for having needed to cough. Um, I think the popularity is only on the rise. Uh, there's, uh, every week, it seems like there's a new Netflix uh, show about, about psychedelics and, and mysticism. Um, and I think it's, I think it's uh, an important um, cultural moment. It would, be, it, would be, it would be stupid to say that it's not. I think that there's a lot of learning we still have to do about them. I think that the, the power in, in these plants and chemicals is one which um, we are just beginning to, to realize how beyond <laughs> beyond our grasp some of them are. Um, I, I myself find a lot of phenomenological parallels between uh, classic mystical experiences and psychedelic experiences. And I think that it's fair in most cases to refer to them um, under the same category. Um, I have some of my own thoughts about perhaps what might be what what that movement and birth might be might be missing, uh, and what lessons from classical mysticism the psychedelic world can take, um, and maybe we'll share those um, in a video form at some point. Thank you for the question. Um, Imad Mansour says, in what ways have religious thinkers within the fold of traditional Judaism engaged in serious ways with Spinoza's theology and mysticism? Is there anything in English you would recommend on this? Interesting. I was just chatting about this with a friend the other night. Um, so there hasn't been a lot of um, serious engagement with Spinoza's thought um, within the fall of traditional Judaism, because Spinoza, as we all know, was um, exercised. He was he was excommunicated from the Jewish community. He was put in harem, and despite many 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 attempts at harem, that uh, excommunication, that ban on him, uh, was never rescinded or lifted. Um, despite that, there have been many attempts to try and uh, reach and bring him back into the community. Uh, the question of whether he would have wanted that or not is is, a, is an interesting question, um, although um, because he can no longer voice his opinion on that, um, we have to just sort of do what we think is right. Here at the channel, we've we've tried in a very small way to to bring Spinoza back and to to present some work, and those have been some of the most uh, enjoyed videos on the channel. I'm very glad I have people reaching out to me, um, telling me that uh, that that they wouldn't they would never would have passed their their Spinoza exam without without the videos. I'm very glad I could help. Um, but beyond the the academic side and helping people on their tests, I I also hope that discussing Spinoza. Um, as people who care, as someone who cares deeply about Judaism, um, and in, in a meaningful way, that that may be part of a process of of <coughs> reincorporating him, and thinking about him, and and uh, and and inviting him back into conversation, um, whether or not the official harem, the official ban on him, is lifted. Um, there's been some the, the the one there's one or two other people who come to mind. Who have engaged with Spinoza, and these are more so um, rabbinic thinkers from the Sephardi world, the contemporary Sephardi world. People like um, Mark Angel, I believe, has done some work um, on Spinoza and some of his colleagues. That's where I would look to see that work being done. Uh, the Ashkenazi world, um, less so. But um, but I think it's a shame, and I think that Spinoza is a beautiful person, and his philosophy is just magnificent. And it's to our own detriment if we don't see him as a Jewish thinker 
engaging with other Jewish thinkers. I mean, there would be no Spinoza if there was no Maimonides. Um, engaging, according to many researchers, with the Kabbalistic tradition through the channel of um, Abraham Cohen de Herrera and others' research, which we presented here. And I think it's about time that we recognize Spinoza's place in tradition, um, although although he was thrown out um, and 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 bring him back. That's my personal feeling. Um, Singh Jaspier says, Hi, Zevi. So proud of you, brother. May your channel grow more. Just love your content. Thank you, brother. Thank you for joining us. It is a pleasure to be creating content with you here. Um, what are my thoughts on Henry Bergson's philosophy? Asks um, Anima Mundi. The animating spirit of all of us. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question, and it, it, I think it also is a good one given the name of your user, um, Bergson. Um, Bergson is interesting because Bergson hit a certain um, live nerve during his, during his day. A French philosopher, Henry Bergson, who was incredibly, uh, incredibly popular, perhaps reaching, perhaps one of the first modern philosophers to reach a proper celebrity status. And yet, uh, entirely uh, unstudied and unread, um, outside of very small academic circles, the public doesn't care for Bergson uh, in the way that there are certain names that still, if I made a video on Henry Bergson, it wouldn't get very many views. Whereas if it was someone like Nietzsche, that would guarantee some views. Um, Bergson, Bergson wrote some interesting <coughs> reflections on mysticism itself, and, and maybe we'll get a chance to to discuss those um his notion of the love of the this the the, the living um fun the, the sort of life at the core of being um is an idea which which i think has a lot of and i mean it does in his own his own acknowledgement a lot of neoplatonic resonances and i think a lot of um sort of even jewish resonances specifically people like ibn gabriel um obviously filtered through later thinkers like Schopenhauer and others, the, the sense of this will and life that's bubbling uh, and driving creation itself. Um, I have to, I have to go back and reread Bergson um, and, and, and maybe do some work on him. Um, but I like the, the, the vitalism, which is central to his philosophy is one which appeals to me. Um, Um, RG says, hi, Zabi, congrats on all your hard work. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any thoughts on Heidegger about being, and is there a mystic correlation to understanding ourselves and our way of being in the world? Wow. Um, we're getting into the modern philosophers proper into, into Burks and the Heidegger. Um, I, I have thoughts on Heidegger. Um, and I think there is a lot of mystic correlation. I think that, um, it's almost difficult to read Heidegger without thinking of the categories of mysticism. And it's very clear that Heidegger um, is, is reading and channeling um, everyone from Nicholas of Cusa to Meister Eckhart to Jacob Burma and, and, and that they're, they're being translated in, in incredibly um, philosophically creative ways in, in his thinking. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say too much now because because we do plan on doing a series of mysticism and modern thought and Heidegger is certainly going to be um, a character in in that series. Um, so let's keep it at that. Um, blah blah says congratulations on 25k Zevi. your channel has been so helpful for me in my life. Many thanks to you and love to you and your team. Thank you blah blah. And thank you to Alyssa for making the channel beautiful again. Um, someone, um, Kai, Kai, uh, Kyriakos asks, are we doing book reading live streams? Um, we should, I'm down to, if you guys are down to, then we definitely should. I'd like to live stream more. I'd like to, I'd like to make it a, a more of a, I know I say that, but I, I really, I really would like to, um, okay. Let's read the Enneads together, or at least or at least a section of it. <laughs> um, I think I'm waiting to get a um, 
a hard copy of the any ads uh, and i'll have no excuse not to do a live stream so when i when i come across one you may have a thing or two coming for you um we have a bunch of people here saying that they have the any ads sitting on their bookshelf and they're they'd love to um to read it together okay okay um <clears throat> Congratulations, Mati says, congratulations on your well-deserved success. What advice would you have for balancing adherence to one's religious tradition while exploring the great wisdoms of other religious pathways? Phenomenal question. <coughs> great question. Um, I I think I don't want to I don't want to speak for anyone else because everyone's journey is is radically different um, and beautifully different. I think that. I think that what I've found for me to be helpful uh, in terms of balancing adherence to my own religious tradition, um, <clears throat> of which I, and and while exploring other great wisdoms um, of other religious pathways, I think that for me, a helpful distinction has been between um, practice and theory. Um, so I think that I've, I've spent a lot of time exploring <clears throat> the, the theories, the ideas of other traditions and being greatly enriched and nourished and inspired by them. Um, but in terms of practice, I stick to practices from my own tradition. Um, for me, that's been a helpful distinction. Um, for others, that 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 may not be a helpful distinction. I'm not, I'm not saying that as if it's the right thing to do or the only thing to do, but for me, that's been helpful um, and that may be helpful. And that, that may be a, a pretty easy rule to apply to, to many um, situations and circumstances. Um, Kenobi, thank you for the answers. I haven't read the little prints, but I give to the book to a, my future to be now ex-wife uh, with a dedication. That's very sweet. Um, future to be now ex-wife. Um, Lowy says tonight is the yard side of Rabbi Lord Sachs, our Lord and Savior, as you once said. Amen. Wow, I I knew that vaguely. I wasn't aware of that, like it was in the periphery of my memory. Um, wow, that is a that's a year already. That's a, that's um, what a beautiful what a beautiful opportunity to be live streaming tonight uh, on the anniversary of the passing of of a beautiful um, rabbi and scholar, orator, educator, leader. Um, Rabbi Sachs, I think Rabbi Sachs would, if I can, if I can <coughs> say to myself, if I can, if I can, if, yeah, I think he, I think he would have been very proud of, of what we're doing here together. Um, and, um, and it, it's a real shame that, that I didn't get a chance to sit down with him for an interview before he passed. Um, and I think the only way to atone for that is to continue doing his work. <coughs> <clears throat> is to continue doing his work and um that's really beautiful that's really beautiful um thank you for sharing that okay <clears throat> robin says i agree that as i say kiddush i believe god has created in six days I connect to it in a way that feels true. It choke it chokes me up all the more. Okay, yeah. So I'm I'm glad I'm glad that uh, that's connecting for you. Um, Mati says, oh, I, I'm going to try not to read compliments here. Combination of the scholarship and passion for me makes such a great job. Thank you. That is very kind. That is very sweet of you. Thank you. We try we try to bring together those values, and um, and and I think they 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 ought to come together. Thank you. Protagonist writes, um, and it looks like we're getting to the end of our questions here, and uh, and there might be maybe we'll aim for uh, for another ten minutes or so. Um, Protagonist writes, I'm an aspiring psychedelic therapist and veteran who's trying to work with the veteran, uh, with the sorry with the VA eventually for psychedelic assisted therapy, uh, veteran association. Is that right? I've been studying for a few years. I've just got my bachelor's. Congratulations, Mazaltov. Um, 
from what I'm gathering, I think they'll be very lucky to have you in the space. And I think that psychedelic assisted therapy uh, could be an incredibly powerful thing for, for veterans and for anyone suffering from PTSD and whatnot. And there's been some very promising research as far as I'm aware in that direction. Uh, and we must, we must, I think, approach these, these modalities as, um, uh, as incredibly powerful tools and gifts, uh, for healing and for connection. Um, and, and I'm, I'm glad to, I'm glad to see that people are taking it seriously and studying and, and putting effort towards that. Any plans on Path of Abranas? Any plans on touching on Samaritan theology and mysticism? Something similar to what we did with the Druze. Yes. Oh my gosh. We've been wanting to do this for ages. So much to do this. So much. I'm going to do this. Thank God. We want to continue our series here going around this, this beautiful and, and torn up land to visit religious minorities. Um, <coughs> the Samaritans are on that list. Uh, and I would love to go. I would love to spend the time to prepare and to go and to interview and to, to meet and to connect with and to share. Um, 100% they're on the list. Um, I wish there was more time in my day so we could we could we could get to all these projects. How Noah Weldenos, how would you approach new have we met Noah? How would you approach new age mysticism, movements like theosophy, <clears throat> astrology, tarot that use mystical elements from the Western tradition? Um I would approach them like I approach any other mystical tradition. Um I try approach mystical traditions with curiosity um and with 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 openness um to to see what they may be doing that's that's unique and creative um what are they bringing together who are they influenced by um who are they influencing these are these are these are interesting questions uh, for me at least um and i've i've spent some time looking into into these traditions from a sort of scholarly academic perspective um and and then shifting more sort of into the practitioner or space of meaningfulness i i would ask questions like uh what is the effect of these traditions what do they do for the people that are following them um what is what kind of what kind of characters do they do they um inculcate and cultivate and produce um and and uh, and to be critical of them when when we see that they're what they're producing is not aligning with values which we hold dear to us uh, and to be respectful and and encouraging and and see to seek to learn from them when they do um and i i don't know if i need to give examples i think it's very i think <clears throat> it's quite well known some of the um darker sides of some of these movements uh, as well as some of the positive sides um <clears throat> Um, Matthew A says, thank you for your wonderful work. So much love. I have a question. If mysticism is central to the human experience, to what extent should the common, um, person be made aware of it as essential practice? Hmm. To what extent? I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Um, if mysticism is central to the human experience, to what extent should the common person be made aware of it as a central practice? Uh, the ascent is like is the question what how much how much of the essential practice of it of the mystic is it to make other humans aware of this experience which is central to them, or how much um, how essential is it to people that they become aware of it? Um, <clears throat> I'm not. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not fully understand the questions if you could clarify that would help um i think how essential is it um ah matthew matthew clarified given that it's esoteric and hidden from most of us um well what what is hidden and what is esoteric um i think i think that what is esoteric often is the theories that are constructed to explain uh, the nature of reality as divulged by these experiences, but I don't know if the experiences themselves are hidden or, or esoteric. Um, they're there if we, uh, if we, you know, do the right practices to reach, to reach us there and sometimes without any practice at all. Um, they, they happen to us. So it seems, um, 
how how essential is it? I don't know. I'm a bit biased. I I I would say, how essential is it um, in a world in a day and age which is uh, facing very large scale um, economic threats that that seem to have emerged from the way that uh, we humans have been treating each other on the planet, um, large scale um, economic inequality and exploitation. Um, large senses of alienation and isolation in contemporary advancing so-called um, progressive societies, um, soaring rates of suicide uh, that only increase with prosperity and increase um, in youth. How essential is it that we come to realize a different way of being, a way of being which is uh, interconnected and and united and um, and one based on kindness and 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 the beauty of the other uh i think it's pretty essential but uh but i don't know i, I think i think i think people may have to ask that for themselves two years what is two years sarah string red congrats on your channel success have you read Death and the Compass by Jorge Luis Borges or any of his short stories? Um, I've read a bunch of his short stories and they are phenomenal. Um, I don't know if Death and the Compass was one of the short stories. I had a I had a collection, an anthology. And I spent a I spent a weekend uh, reading, <clears throat> but I don't know if that was one of them. But uh, incredible uh, author and poet. Um, if we if we get the chance, we'll also make some content on Borges and his relationship with mysticism. Uh, he had a relationship uh, pretty well known with with uh, Gershon Shalom, the father of the modern study of Jewish mysticism. Uh, all stuff that that we would love to explore here and make content on. Uh, very 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 blessed that this is my life that I get to be making content about people like Borges and and their relationships to to the mysteries of life and being. <clears throat> okay. RG says, Zevi, I've been watching you for about a year now, and you've made a big difference in my life. Thank you. Um, um, if I can ask one more question, of course. <laughs> what is the meaning of unity to you? What inspires you to achieve that? Um, <laughs> uh, well. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'm going to, to, not give a uh, an analytical or a philosophical definition of unity, and um, talk about what it, what it might or might not be. I'm gonna, I'm gonna instead talk about <clears throat> um, an experience. Um, to me, unity is the the sense of of closeness and intimacy with something that we previously consider to be other than us uh, in a way that our own identity seems to dissolve its boundaries and envelop that which that with which we are experiencing unity and that can be a person it can be a pet it can be a tree it can be the universe as a whole um, it's a sense of of intimacy uh, of closeness um, of of deep connection um, a sense that that I would do uh, everything in my power to to make sure that this thing that I am uh, encountering can uh, can flourish and be happy and and uh, and to me that's what unity means in this moment in a, a bit more of an emotional reflection less less philosophical. Um, I had a very beautiful. Uh, I'm not, share this. I had a very beautiful experience um, um, recently. Um, in I was in the park Saturday um, with a close friend, and uh, we were sitting near um, like a children's play area. And as the sun set um, and it got darker, we saw there was a little girl wandering away from the play area. And she looked quite distressed and she at one point stopped and like 
kind of broke down crying near a tree. She must have been all of like, I don't know, five or six years old. Um, and we went over to her and realized that she didn't speak any English or Hebrew. Um, and then saw that she had uh, the, the label of her school on her sweater, which was in Arabic. And in the very little broken Arabic that I that I know, I was able to ask her her name and and if she was okay. And it, what happened basically, you can probably figure, is that she had become separated from her parents. Uh, and I put out my hand to her. Her name was Shem, uh, which funnily enough means name in Hebrew. Uh, and she took my hand and together we went to find her parents and we did, we found her dad. But the moment that she took my hand, she stopped crying and there was a sense of composure and and um, confidence that that came back to her or, or so i felt and um and to me that was a moment the, the ability to to reach out to something uh and to and to to return um in that gesture of of trust of unity of whereas we go down the street every day and we encounter people and they're strangers they're potential threats uh they're they're enemies um and we need to protect ourselves and that's that's a sense of self-preservation which is important there are moments when we can take down that barrier and we can reach out and extend a hand. Um, and in that closeness, um, there, there is a unity. And, and for me in that moment, um, if she would not have been able to find her father, I would have been incredibly distressed. And, and the sense of that their well-being becomes my well-being. Um, and it's, it could be fleeting and I could never see her again in my life. And, but, um, but there's a sense where in that moment there was a, a shared, um, shed recognition of, of, of a common humanity and, and perhaps even common divinity beneath our humanity uh, or, or within our humanity. Um, and what inspires me to achieve that is that I want to live in a world where those are the kind of interactions that we have with our neighbors and with our strangers and with people around us, uh, interactions. And I'm, I'm not saying this to make myself some kind of hero. I think this is what any normal human would have done in the situation. But I'd like to live in a world where um, that becomes where that becomes the default and, and and I think it's only I think it's a form of insanity that that's that we could do anything other than that um I think it's I think it's uh, and that's what that's what inspires me to achieve it because I think it's it's only sane and normal and it's and it's the most beautiful world that we could be living that we could be living in <clears throat> RG thank you for your lessons kind friend and teacher thank you friend I hope to I hope to get to meet you one day and I hope to meet all of you beautiful people if you do meet me, uh, come over, say hi, don't be shy. Question from Anima Mundi. What an incredible hangout this has been. From You guys are pulling me back and forth from, <laughs> from the scholarly, you're pulling me back and forth from, <laughs> from the scholarly to the emotional, from the existential to the meaningful, well, from the religious, back into the academic. What a what a what a trip. It's all it's all really, it all blows at some point, or or hopefully we can we can try and make it all. Um, um, Anima Mundi, uh, let's take a few more questions here. Uh, wondering if I've come across the book Crossing Boundaries, Essay on the Ethical Status of Mysticism, a book by J. William Bernard and Jeffrey Kripal. Huh. Um, I've read a bunch of Kripal's work. Ethical Status of Mysticism. Ah, Crossing Boundaries. Okay, I saw Crossing Boundaries referenced uh, in... Wolfson's uh, <coughs> um, um, what was Wolfson's work on, on, on ethics and mysticism called uh, it was called Beyond the Gift or Beyond the Boundary or something like that um, and I, I think I added it to my read list but I haven't got to it just yet um, thank you for reminding me um, Stephen McKenna's translation of Plotinus uh, says, Mr. Anshi. Um, Protagus, appreciate it, but love the channel. Keep up the hard work. Thank you. You, you guys inspire me to, to keep up the hard work, so thank you. Um, Gallen Meyer says, I grew up culturally Jewish and found deep spirituality in science and philosophy in Eastern traditions. You helped me see how much I was missing in my own tradition. Thank you, Zevi. Oh, I'm really glad. I'm really glad, Gal. I'm really glad uh, that I was able to help you with that. <clears throat> and um, I'm really glad if I can help anyone find um, 
things that they're missing in their own tradition from whichever tradition they come. I think it's so important to explore our own traditions. Um, it's really important to, to, I think, dig in the soil around their own trees and roots um, as much as we can gain from from the rich soils and nutrients and other in other patches i think i think digging has to be uh primarily and, and first in, in our own of, of from whatever tradition we come from which is something which i always encourage um thank you Gallon. um tell it to my mother she'll be very happy um thank you robin says thank you for my answer to matthew oof now i need to remember what i answered to matthew uh Louis asks, have I met with the modern-day Kabbalists, Rabbi Yitzchak, Mayor, Mergerson, Schlitter from Jerusalem? I have. I, I met him I met him uh, like three years ago, maybe, and uh, had a very brief uh, interaction, conversation with him. Um, but... Um, we're doing now a series where we're interviewing scholars of mysticism and you'll see that coming out. We have some really exciting stuff. I'd love to do a series of interviewing like mystics, Kabbalists, and he would definitely be up on my list. And I, I have a bunch of connections, uh, friend, mutual friends. <laughs> what a weird thing to say. I have mutual friends with uh, Itch Mayer. But um, I guess, I guess the Chavraya Kedisha. Um, that, so that would be fun. If, if he would say yes to, to sit down for an interview, that would be epic, uh, along with some other great Kabbalists here. Um, um, Red asks El Zahir El, El, El Aleph, what do you make of these objects? I'm not sure what is being referenced there. Um, Matthew said, cool beans, thanks. Loved your answer. Oh, apparently Matthew got an answer. Oh, oh, Matthew asked about um. Oh, about um, oh, whether it's an essential practice. Great. Oh, that's the answer that that Robin appreciated. Okay, good. Um, Gallen says, um, Oh, um, my internet tells me that the connection is unstable, that it needs to reconnect. Is that true? Am I gone? Can you hear me? Should I wait? Can anybody hear me? Connection is stable. Okay. My thing tells me that the connection is not stable, but I will continue. If uh, if polymathing, oh, okay. People say they can hear me. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. I'll ignore. I'll ignore then what the uh, what YouTube is telling me. Um. <clears throat> Gallon says, very interested in online interfaith learning and practice communities. I would be thrilled to participate with something like uh, with something like that with you and this community. I think we're already doing it in some sense, and um, and I hope to do it more and find ways to do that, um, both online and in person. I think that's really important. Um, and we we're kind of making steps towards that with the discord that we set up, which is a place for community. And it's really a very, very, the most diverse community that I've seen ever. Um, so head over to our discord. The link is all over the channel. Um, you'll see it in the top bar. Um, I really, I'd love to do that too. Um, by the way, if my internet goes down, um, then tell me and I'll like, tell me that you can't hear me and uh, I'll stop talking. Okay. Mm, what is next? Um, Adelaine Diaz, I hope you're, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Please, Evie, can you talk about the Song of Songs and the Union of Divine and Feminine Masculine? <laughs> Certainly. <clears throat> it's something which we've um, spoken about a bunch. Um, 
on the channel. I'm trying to think if there's one video in particular where we discussed that theme. Maybe in our class in the Zohar, we discussed that. But um, <clears throat> the, the union of the divine, um, feminine and masculine, <clears throat> it really in some ways is the central theme of of the Kabbalists in both in their theory and their practice. Um, the arguably the greatest Kabbalist of Jewish history, Isaac Luria, uh, famous for his work of Yichudim, of unifications, uh, <clears throat> gives us the, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> gives us the, the prayer, the incantation that, uh, that many Kabbalistically inspired Jews recite before performing any ritual act of observance, which is L'Shem Yichud Kuchaburich Moshchin Te'eliachada Shem Yud Kebavav Kebichud Shalim B'Shem Kol Yisrael that that I am partaking of this activity solely for the purpose of reuniting Kuchaburich the divine masculine Shchinte and its and and his divine feminine Liachadam to to bring them back together. Uh, Moshe Idel calls mitzvot for the Kabbalists the divine aphrodisiac trying to to bring back love to the divine couple that's been separated the the hieros gamos in the greek um which which in a sense uh is is gets expanded to mean everything that that because everything is broken up by the kabbalists into the binary of masculine and feminine so when we're uniting uh idea and action if we have an idea in our head and we put it into thought we're uniting masculine and feminine feminine the body the masculine the idea for the kabbalists <clears throat> when we um when we when we when we when we take food and we absorb the nutrients and we can take that energy and we put it into 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 activity of the word, uh, we're uniting everything. Everything is is seen in this in this sexual erotic content. Um, <clears throat> I think it was <clears throat> I think it was uh, Howard Bloom who described the Kabbalists as uh, the genre of the Kabbalists um, as as bad eroticism, um, and I don't know why it's bad. But, but it's really it's really the whole story of the Kabbalists, and uh, and for the Kabbalists, there is no central text uh, like the Song of Songs, the Shir Shirim, where um, where that uh, is is most evident, um, and it becomes the it becomes the Bible of the Kabbalists in many in many senses. This 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 very confusing erotic story of of the of the dance. Uh, of the of the chase of the of the lover for the beloved, um, so so it's a it's a huge huge central theme, um, and it's something which is which is always present. I think I think we I think we touched on it recently as well in the Freud video, which kind of makes sense, um, but. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the the the, the chapters of Shir Hashem, the poetry there becomes incredibly central to the Kabbalists. Um, many many of the ideas are going to be become canonically commented on and and discussed. Um, think about something like Chapter Five, when uh, when the woman lover in the story, um, her like sort of the climax of the of the of the song in some sense. The male lover comes to greet her, and she's already gotten undressed, and she's in bed, and she she says, "You're not welcome." Call um, and she hears the the voice of her beloved knocking. Pischi uh, li, open up for me. Achesi, rayasi, yanasi, samasi. All these terms of endearment. My my lover, my dove, my my drug, uh, my my sibling. Strange word to use in the context, but. Um, and and uh, and the Kabbalists refer to this as the experience of the soul, the soul, which is depicted often in in the, in the feminine, uh, which goes about its business and and can come lost in life in the materialism of everyday life, uh, the consumerism of everyday life. And at times we hear the kol doidi defek, we hear the voice of the of the lover knocking, saying, "Pischi li, open up for me, open up, open up a door." Uh, and the sages say, "If we open up the eye of a needle, God opens up." the the entrance of of the worlds to us so that's uh that's there's, there's so much that the, and we could do we could do not just an episode but, but a series on on that thank you for the question and um adeline adeline diaz 
Um, PC Clarity asks, have you ever ate fish from Galilee? Do they still do the fishermen there? When I go to the Galilee, I try not to be a fisherman, but a fisher of men. <laughs> um, <laughs> next question from BC Clary. How do you untangle? Question mark. Hair care recommendations appreciated. Um, my hair care regimen, uh, the way which I untangle is I, um, I jump into the shower and I scrunch my hair with water and nothing else. And I get out and I shake it and I let it dry. That's, that's, that's the only, that's the only thing that goes in my hair and, uh, does just fine for me. Um, Kenobi, have you read Rabbi Stephen Let Letters Leader's book? Uh, for you and I am gone. I have not. Should I read it? Sarah is giving a smiley face and a high five, I think, for the story I shared. <laughs> You're still here. Uh, Polly Mathing, Zevi, what are your thoughts on... Um... <laughs> By the way, YouTube still tells me that my connection is unstable and that I should wait till they reconnect me, but I guess we will carry on with or without YouTube's approval. Um, what are your thoughts on cutting hair, both of the, both on both of the head and the beard? Oh, having a lot of the hair care questions come in. Um, um, my thoughts on cutting hair. I think I think people should cut their hair if they feel like it's too long and needs a cut. I don't know. I um, I'm pretty low maintenance. I I I've been cutting my own hair now for a few years. Um. The, uh, the the last person to cut my hair before that was my mom. My mom um, was a professional um, hairdresser and uh, wig maker uh, for many years, um, specializing in in making wigs for women uh, that had lost their hair due to uh, 